Hello, everyone. Today, I'm speaking with David Cruz, the owner of multiple businesses, including a music label and leather company. Among other things, we discuss the pursuit of hyper excellence, drug use, God finding us in the most unlikely of settings, and overcoming anxiety. Stay with us. Hey everyone, thanks for joining us on another episode of The Catholic Gentleman. I'm your host, John Heinen. So grateful that you are here. Before we get into this amazing interview that we're about to uh, learn a lot uh, from, from this man, Dave Cruz, we, uh, we wanted to in- just make a comment that we're launching the Catholic Gentleman membership program. It's going to be the Catholic Gentleman Plus. It's coming out on June 1st. I am so excited about it. We are 500 plus hours in the making, three years of, of thought putting into this to help men in all ways, shapes, and forms, unique videos, unique experts, um, unique uh, challenges, and things like that. So uh, stay tuned. Uh, Head over to catholicgentleman.com. Sign up to our email list if you're not already so that you can get notifications uh, for that. If this is your first time listening to us, we'd love it if you hit that subscribe button so that you can get each of these episodes. If you've listened to us multiple times, you can now write reviews and give thumbs up on both Apple Podcasts and on Spotify. So we'd love for your reviews. That helps us reach more men. So without further ado, I'm going to dive right in. We're going to talk to David Cruz here. So David was born and raised in Minnesota, like myself. He's the youngest of six children in a family of artists and musicians. Uh, Some of our frequent listeners know I'm a professional trumpet player, so we've got the musical background as well. After a rebellious teenage year, years, he went through a radical reconversion to Catholicism while performing as a professional musician. And this is going to be an interesting conversation. So after cleaning up his life, he felt called to share the gospel. So he joined the seminary there in Minnesota at the Diocese of Winona, Rochester. And then he didn't give up quickly. After eight years, uh, he felt called by God to out of seminary in order to use his creative gifts to do evangelization there as a lay man. And so there's also another story that I'm looking forward to. So he met his wife, Emma. And if living in Minnesota wasn't enough, he decided to move to Brisbane, Australia. So he's the owner of Oremus Catholic Leatherwork. And uh, we'll talk about that. He also owns Enemy Love Records, which is a Catholic record company and he works full-time for the archdiocese of brisbane he is an avid outdoorsman reader painter and all-around gentleman david how are you doing today good thanks for having me john it's good to see you again yeah likewise i'm excited that you're here you prefer to go by dave or david either one either one's fine all right awesome well um, going forward. So, so Dave, I want, tell me a little bit about your, uh, struggles in your, in your childhood. I always like to start. We like to kind of go through chronological because we get a little bit of an experience of the men that are on this show so that we can see how God has challenged them, how his grace has uh, redeemed them and brought them forth. And you have got a story, so I'd love to hear mm. it. Yeah. I mean, when I, when I was a kid, uh, I mean, honestly, back in the back in the early Cruz family, you know, I was born in '89, so the '90s, they were pretty great. You know, my my early childhood was wonderful. Uh, we lived in Mankato, and we had a big house. You know, everybody was home. My oldest sister, you know, didn't graduate high school until I was about five or six. Um, so those first years were really beautiful. Um, but I would say, as far as struggles, like that, really kind of hit uh, later in later in childhood and early teen years, you know, and it, and it really came when my parents, they, they split up. Um, they didn't divorce yet, but they split up and, and just mm. lived separately because they just needed some space and they were trying to figure some things out and, and, and then they got back together and, and split up again and, um, kind of, um, you know, as the youngest for anybody that, you know, you grow up in a big family and, and the youngest it tends to get the, the, the best and the worst of things in a lot of ways, mm-hmm. you know, because if, because if things are going well, you know, um, they tend to, uh, kind of not have as strict a rules as the oldest one and <laughs> yes, sir. they get a lot of yeah. attention. And, you know, I like to, I like to think that all of the, um, you know, the intelligence and the good looks and the talents of the family kind of consolidate in the youngest, but not everybody <laughs> That's right. trickle down and, and eventually <laughs> like, 
mm-hmm. it, it, it boils down. Um, yeah. So, uh, as far as, you know, my childhood, it was, um, it was those teenage years where everybody was gone. You know, most of my mm-hmm. siblings were, uh, they were moved out and, um, that was when my parents and their marriage really started to struggle. And yeah, I got, uh, I got into all kinds of stuff. I started doing music when I was about 11. I started, started mm-hmm. playing and, um, yeah, I, I joined band, you know, playing the saxophone and the drums yeah. and, um, uh, and then my brother kind of taught me guitar like a little bit, but it just kind of snowballed. I was just obsessed with it. I just, I just loved it. And so I taught myself how to play bass guitar. I taught myself how to play mandolin. And then I taught myself how to play the flute because it's the same fingerings as a saxophone, just a different embouchure. And, um, yeah. And so by the time I was about 15, I had written a full album, um, and recorded it. Our high school luckily had a, a recording studio. Our band director was, a, was awesome. And, um, yeah, I was doing music pretty full on by then. Uh, and it was wow. kind of like the music trajectory was going up, you know, mm. I was just headed, headed for the stars in that direction. But, um, the family situation was, was pretty rough, you know? Mm. Um, yeah, it, uh, I don't know how, how far into my, uh, yeah, my no. So you found a get, kind of like a, uh, well, two questions. One, it sounds like Bella Fleck had an influence when I start hearing, you know, bass guitar <laughs> and, and mandolin and, and you got Victor Wooten and all That's those guys. That is, um, yeah, exactly. It's a, as a, a group that Bella was Fleck. Yeah, um, the Bella Fleck and the Fleck Tones, they're influential in my uh, my youth. Are they um, really? Growing up. Can, I, yeah, can I tell a funny, quick story yeah, about dude, Bella Fleck? <laughs> yeah, okay. tell me. So they came to Mankato when I was, oh. this is, I, I don't know <laughs> if I, I should even tell this story. It was yeah, please. slightly, uh, slightly uh, illegal, but um, they came to Mankato and they played at the Civic Center in Mankato, right? And so mm-hmm. they had blocked off half of the arena. Of course, and my yeah. brother, my oldest brother and one of his good friends and I wanted to go to the concert, but we just thought the ticket prices were outrageous. They I'm were sure like they 18 were. bucks, <laughs> 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 which now I look back and I'm like, really? We couldn't, we couldn't afford that. So we, we, we found like this back door and, and I don't know how we did it, but we got into the backstage area, but they wow. were out playing. They were on the stage. So we were in the backstage area somehow. I don't know how there wasn't security or anything. And then we crawled under the curtain that covered like the bleachers <laughs> and we snuck into the concert that way. <laughs> oh, we the life of you. Like so bad. Anyway, yeah. How was yeah. it though? It was great. It was insane. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Like Victor Wooten, you yeah. know, um, yeah, he, he did like his 12 minute bass solo I thing. Solo, you know, which, and it was yeah. insane, you know, and, and we were just like, it's kind of like, in in some ways it was really impressive. In some ways it was kind of like, um, you know, it's very like musical mathematics in a lot of ways, yeah. you know, like mm, Humphreys McGee sure. and, and, uh, yeah. dream theater. Like sometimes it's very, like, it's so advanced that it's kind of, it's not like Simon and Garfunkel, like the songwriting yeah, is not on mm-hmm. the same yeah, agreed. wavelength. So, um, yeah, it was a really cool experience. I think, I think for me, the most influential thing was watching Victor Wooden play the bass because bass is I bet it was. by far my favorite instrument to play. But, yeah, you know. well, that's exa- I appreciate you sharing that with me and, and yeah. with our <laughs> listeners here. Um, so did you find kind of like a certain um, escapism? Like, did you or did you find an escape in music right from the, the struggles and the difficulties? And then, you know, your musical trajectory, it wasn't faith based, right? It was it was more, I don't know, pop, rock and roll. What are we looking at? Yeah, yeah, it was it was more more or less secular. Um, there was always a faith element in my life. And um yeah, music was an escape. Music was music is to this day uh, somewhat of an anomaly to me. You know, mm. it's it does something. Musicians are we're a weird breed. You know, there's and and I really believe that that um, artists in general kind of have yeah. a, a unique experience of reality. I think part mm. of it is that as a musician. Music is such an emotionally evocative art form that I believe that artists uh, and and musicians in particular tend to uh, almost overdevelop uh, their connection with particular emotions, Mm. you know, and um, there's, there's, there's all kinds of like different 
you know, um, research and different things about this, but it's really fascinating to me as it relates to, to my life, you know, it was, it was an escape for sure, but it was also kind of like a drug in a lot of mm. ways, you know, it was like an addiction. Yeah. You know? And, and I really, looking back, I really believe that, um, it, it was in a lot of ways, it was my pressure release valve. You know what I mean? Yeah. It was the way in which this stuff just came out, whether I liked it or not, you know? And I remember, um, yeah, my brothers were hugely influential on me because, you know, in, in my family, it's three girls and then three boys. So the three yeah. boys are the youngest. And my two, my two older brothers were great musicians as well. And, um, yeah, their, you know, their preference as far as what type of music they were, they were like, um, a lot more careful about what they listened to, you know? Mm -hmm. And I, and looking back, I realized that like, for, for me, I, I wanted to get into a lot more intense music than, than they did. Yeah. And now as a 33 year old, looking back at my teenage self, I, I see more that like what I was going through was was a bit more intense than, than probably what they were going through. You know, yeah. I think they, they had their own story and they have their own struggles and all that. But I think in particular, like in our family situation, you know, by the time they left, I was home and yeah, things were, things were just very tough for us, you know, and, um, it was just a very tense, it was a very tense environment and there was a lot of different dynamics there and all that. But yeah, so I escaped into music and, you know, I, I kind of invested everything in it. You know, I, I was a, I was a good runner. <laughs> yeah, I get that. Yeah. Back. Uh, when I was a good, um, well actually literally I was a good runner. I was, a, yeah. I was in track yeah. and field and, and, um, at one point I just, you know, I had, I had these three good friends, uh, when I was growing up and, um, one of them became an awesome hockey player. One of them was an awesome soccer player and one of them was an mm. awesome football player. And I was a, and I was a good runner and yeah. I was like, I just remember thinking when I was about 14, like my three buddies as, as awesome as they are. And one of them actually holds the state record for most goals scored in a game, in a soccer oh, game. Wow. He was yeah. an awesome soccer player. And, um, as good as they are, they're not good enough to make a career out of their sport. Mm -hmm. They're not. And yeah. I remember thinking to myself, even at 14, I was like, I'm good enough at music that I could make a career out of it, but I'm not a good enough runner. And so yeah. I just invested everything into music. And I think that's really where, where this achievement started was, you know, as a 14 year old musician, you know, I'm playing guitar and I'm playing whatever I go to a band concert and, or I go to a party even, you know, I go to a campfire and you're playing guitar and the, you know, the prettiest girl there, you know, thinks you're awesome. Cause you're the guitar mm -hmm. guy, you know, and you go to a band concert and everybody's parents are like, wow, that was really great, David, you know? And it was just that affirmation. Like, yeah. and, and, and that I think is what I just needed so bad as a teenager. I just, I just, you know, I went okay, from having yeah. a great, great home life where everybody was there and it was a lot of fun and there was a lot of liveliness to my teenage years where it was just me and mom and dad and things were really tough. Really well. And so yeah. I just, man, I just reached out and doubled down, you know. On well, the, I appreciate on you sharing that. Front. You know, I never heard it uh, described as an addiction. I think that's very fascinating because for me, it was a little bit different, right? So I had to be the best at everything. And that was, mm -hmm. that was my addiction, right? Was, was being the best at everything from sports to uh, academics to music. And I found the most joy in music. And so for me, I was always neck and neck working my way up through high school and being the best at everything. And, uh, um, 700 kids in my graduating class. And then, um, I was a salutatorian all the way up until my, my, uh, senior year. And then I was third and, um, and trumpet, same thing. So when I was going to college, I got a full ride to college on, on music. And I was like, you know what? I find the most joy in music. Like music keeps me from having ulcers and, and wanting to go crazy. <laughs> and so I decided to invest all my attention into trumpet, but it became, it, it, it in a way became an addiction because I would hold my trumpet for probably upwards to nine hours a day, you know, every day. And I knew I could make a career doing it. Uh, but at the same time, it was, uh, 
I was still trying, having to let go of that fear of failure and, and, you know, things of that. So reflect more on that, uh, that addictive aspect, but switching back, going into your life as a seminarian. So, I mean, what happened between, you know, investing your time into music and then all of a sudden saying, Hey, I'm gonna, I'm gonna become a priest or, Mm. and I mean, eight years that that's a, that's a discernment right there. That's um, (laughs) so I'd love to, I'd love to hear about that transformation that occurred there and how God's will or how your pursuit of God's will was starting to, uh, you know, kind of, um, show itself in the process, which I think it does for, for so many men. Yeah. Well, it was, it was a wild ride. Um, I think, imagine there's not a ton of kids that listen to this podcast. So I'll share, I'll share it fairly explicitly. But what happened is, um, when I was about 20 throughout my high school years, I got more and more into drugs, you know, mm-hmm. and, um, and, and drinking, I, I was a big drinker, you know, and that started when I was about 13. Um, and, uh, yeah, it, it was just another form of escape for me. You yeah. Know? And, um, that pretty much just grew and grew until I was about 20. And when I was about 20, I went through a bit of what I call a secular conversion where, um, I just realized that my life was a mess and I needed to clean it up. And I thought, well, I should, I should start, you know, getting up at a normal time and, and start, you know, drinking less and whatever. Um, but it wasn't a commitment yet. It was kind of like, you know, you know, in the spiritual life when you're like, um, it's not until you fight back against the vice that you really mm. feel it, you know, it's Amen. almost like, you know, the, the evil one, like once you, once you turn against it, then it shows you how evil it is, you know? And, yeah. and that's kind of what happened for me at that time. It was like, all right, I got to clean up my life. And then a couple, no joke, a couple months later, I went down to a music festival and, and, um, this was really the, the moment of conversion for me, but went down to a music festival called Shangri-La which okay. means paradise, <laughs> yeah. um, yeah. which is interesting in, um, in hindsight, because what happened is went to the music festival and, and, um, there's a ton of people I know down there and they were all doing a bunch of cocaine. Mm. And I, had, I, I, of, of all the drugs that I had tried, cocaine was not one of them. I had never even seen it for whatever reason. I did a bunch of cocaine that night mm. and, it was two in the morning or so and I'm walking around and remember walking from one place to another with some, you know, people I thought, thought were friends. Um, and I just had this, it wasn't a voice, but it was, it was an imprint of a voice in my heart. You know what I mean? Like that, the way that, the way that the Lord speaks and it's almost like a stamp in the heart and then you can see the etching that's there. And it was like the Lord saying, David, where are you? You know? Mm. And that's literally, and and it stopped me in my tracks and I immediately felt sober, you know? And I was like, I got to get out of here. I need to leave right now. And it was the most loved I've ever felt in my life at that moment. Mm. There was no judgment, no condemnation. It was just, it was just, David, where are you? I'm looking for you. I'm searching for you. And the, the, the providential thing that I've noticed years and years later is that the festival was called Paradise, right? Yeah. Shangri-La. And it was like Adam and Eve, like that sin, mm-hmm. you know, and, 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 and God comes and looks for them and says, where are you? And they're hiding in the bushes, you know? He's not wow. judging them. He's not condemning them. He just actually loves them. He's trying to seek them out, trying to bring Amen. them back into the light. And so I left the festival and I went out by this little lake and... um I just sat there. I sat there for probably six hours, just letting everything out. And what I realized, it was, it was a really, oh my gosh, it was just a very grace filled, uh, morning. Cause I sat there until the sun came all the way up, you know? Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> and, exactly. Um, Cause it was like 2 AM, you know, I probably sat there until like 7 AM or 8 AM or whatever. But, um, but I realized in that moment, I think through a special grace, I realized that I had gotten to the point in my life that I was at because of the brokenness that I went through uh, Mm. my family and, you know, various things. A lot of the choices that I made, you know, I wasn't like free of guilt, but 
there was a lot of things that I just realized that like, um, I don't know. There was just this sense of like, God, God wants to actually bring me into the good life that I desire. You know, mm-hmm. it was just this really profound moment for me as a teenager, yeah. you know, and, and I knew that love from when I was a little kid. Cause when I was a little kid, I was, I was very into my faith. That was where I first felt called to the priesthood was when yeah. I was about six, you know? And, um, and so I had this kind of, you know, kind of sort of internal connection with God or awareness at least of, of what could be. And it had just gotten so obscured over the years. And in that moment, I, I felt it again. But then what happened is, uh, you know, it's, it's 9 a.m. or whatever. I hadn't slept. Yeah. I had just done mm-hmm. a ton of cocaine and, and quite a bit of alcohol. And, um, you know, so I, I go to bed uh, at yeah. 9 a.m. I sleep all day. I wake up that night because we had to do another performance at the festival. And I felt horrible. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you're still alive, but yeah, absolutely. Oh I imagine gosh. you did. Wow. So it was like psychologically, I went from a, a, a really, you know, beautiful moment and, and, and grace filled moment to just hell, you know, in a lot mm-hmm. of ways. Mm-hmm. And I'm really grateful for that time. I'm almost, I'm almost as, as grateful for that, for the, for the valley, for the cliff yeah. that I, you know, fell off yeah. of into suffering than I am for the high moment. Because what happened is in that moment, in that suffering, and I think there's so much like that I've learned about how God works in that moment of suffering, it was time for me to respond. And I wasn't motivated by how good it felt to feel God's love. I wasn't Mm. motivated by anything. I was only motivated. I I wasn't motivated. It was literally just, I was free. I was perfectly able to, to choose with my free will, you know, there was nothing pulling me, whatever. And I, and I decided that day in that horrible state that I was going to pray every day for the rest of my life Mm. because I knew that that was the right thing to do. I knew that even if I felt like this for the rest of my life, I don't care. It doesn't matter. It's not about me anymore. It's about God working through me. It's about God being real. You know, it's about God being who he is, you know, and, and, and having brought me out of that and into a different life and a life of salvation, you know. Well, and if we could just pause right there, and I think that's such an important point, you know, because why do we as men pray? We pray because God calls us to, right? Not because of how it makes us feel, not because, you know, and and you hear that we get this often uh, where there's, there's other men in our lives or we're having these conversations with them and they will say things like, you know what, I I was praying every day or I was trying to do the rosary and stuff, but I just didn't feel good. Like it wasn't, um, it, it, I I wasn't noticing any change and it, you know, and, and sometimes it was just hard. And I mean, that's, that's the best time to pray. Right. And that's also not the reason why we pray. We pray because it's a conversation with Christ. We pray because God is seeking after you as he was seeking after you. And you know, that is how we build this relationship with him. That is how we grow in holiness. And we can be reminded of our own sinfulness or wickedness or slavery that we need to be removed from this bondage and then grow into that love and that union. And it's not about how we feel. And so, I mean, it does, it sounds like you had grace upon grace upon grace and I am just, uh, I'm moved. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I know we're in the middle of like your story about getting into seminary and we need to keep on going in that direction. But, um, I really appreciate you um, yeah. commenting and telling us that story. Yeah. Thanks for that. Yeah. Yeah. It's true. I mean, it's just, it's a, it becomes a lifeline, you know, the whole, the whole like vine and the branches thing, like it just gets more and more real, you know? Yeah. And, um, the, just the reality of coming to life by being connected to the vine, you know, mm. like, it's, it's, we, yeah, we grow leaves and we become more able to, we become stronger, more able to carry fruit, you know, children, our marriage, you know, our vocation, the priesthood, whatever it is, like we just become more and more capable of it. And prayer is like, prayer is like the growth process of the, you know, of the vine itself, you know, and, Without a doubt. and, and into the branches anyway. So after that, you know, I come back to Mankato, you know, I went through this big conversion. I'm like, all right, I'm going to start going to daily mass, start going to daily mass at, at the beautiful, you know, St. Peter and Paul's church in Mankato. And, um, uh, 
I'm the youngest person there by about 35 years. <laughs> <laughs> and sure. at one point, this focus missionary, uh, Chris Rothschild, who's he's out in Colorado, um, he came and, and sought me out and he said, hey, um, you want to come up to the Newman Center? There's a lot younger people up there you can go to mass okay. with. <laughs> and I said, oh, yeah, that sounds great. And um, he became a great friend, and and uh, he ended up marrying one of the missionaries that was also in Mankato, and they live out in Colorado now. Right. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, th- that was just another extension of the the conversion. You know, was getting involved in a community where, you know, discerning your vocation, um, considering the possibilities that God has in store for you as a young person, mm. was just a daily conversation. You know, there was all kinds of people and. Um, myself and a, a few other people, uh, there was a guy named Ben, Ben Keller who ended up, uh, uh, joining the Dominicans. He's, he's, I believe he's yeah. a Dominican priest now. Um, but, um, yeah, anyway, I spent that time kind of discerning. And at one point I, I really wanted to join the CFRs in New York and I went out there and yeah. visited with them, but didn't feel like that was quite right for me. Um, and, uh, yeah, I, I wanted to, I, I, I felt like God wanted me to do, um, diocesan seminary, you know, and I okay. love Minnesota as, yeah. as much as I have moved away from Minnesota, yeah, Minnesota quite a ways my, away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the only, the only further you can get is the middle of the Indian ocean, you know, off there of you go. Um, yeah, no, I love Minnesota too, where my family were heading up there this summer. Praise be to God. Nice. So, yeah, I'm looking forward Good to it. So anyways, visit. yeah. So you love Minnesota and diocesan yeah. priesthood though is. Yeah. And the diocese of Winona, yeah, jumped into seminary there. And, and that was, you know, that was huge because um, to this day, you know, some of the best friends I've ever had, you know, uh, were in seminary there. And I loved, I loved seminary. You know, mm. sometimes people are like, you love seminary so much. Why did you leave? You know? Yeah. But that's a whole nother question. And, and, um, but I, I loved it, you know, it's just a, for anybody that's discerning the priesthood, like I, I'm convinced that, um, in the hands of good formators at a seminary, a guy from go, a guy from, a guy can go from anything to yeah. a saint. If he takes the mm. formation process seriously and really engages with the opportunity to grow in virtue and to grow in holiness, like really to, you, you have to go in with faith. You have to go in with the attitude that the goal of seminary is, is not necessarily ordination, mm-hmm. but holiness, you know? Mm. Amen. And like, Amen. if you go in just wanting that and just thirsting for that every day and realizing how much of a gift it is to be able to dedicate every day of your life to that then man, you can just like, just you can change the world. You set the world That's on fire, absolute. you know? And, yeah. And I felt, I felt really, you know, seminary for me was like that. I just, man, everything, I think everything in my life that's going well <laughs> is yeah. basically due to the fact that, you know, the conversion, the grace of God, but so much of it was the, the seminary. And wow, that's so great. Yeah. And so, um, you'll have to share with us now. I mean, I want to have time to talk about, you know, achievement and, you know, struggles and anxiety <laughs> and stuff, but I, I'm very curious. So how did you hear God and how did God direct you to the lay life or the married and then ultimately the married life? Like what, what was that um, process for you? Yeah, it was, painful. (laughs) Mm, mm. That's what the process was for me. I didn't want to leave. I didn't. Mm. But what happened is in 2019, I I came off of a um, pastoral year um, and uh, which was a beautiful, beautiful year, you know. Um, And uh, the winter of 2019, I was entering my third year of theology. So at the end of your third year of theology, you're ordained as a deacon. So you're required by canon law to go on a diaconate retreat. I scheduled my diaconate retreat for Corpus Christi in December of 2019. So about three months before the world went crazy. Um, Yeah. And um, yeah, went on this retreat and I don't know how to describe it other than the retreat was just pure. um, It it was, there was, there was just a massive amount of suffering. It was a massive amount of suffering. And I, and it wasn't, it wasn't like, um, well, at the time I just didn't know. I didn't know what the yeah. heck was going on. I just thought, mm. man, this is the most intense 
and horrible retreat I've ever been on. You know, there's, mm. there's nothing. I can't even figure out what's going on, you know, and every day yeah. I talk to my spiritual director and I'm like, I don't know what's happening, you know. Would you describe it as like a dark attempt. night? Yeah, or, or was it, oh, you gosh. know? I think it was a it was a combination of a lot of things. I okay. think there was I think there was some some deep stuff that had been stirred up in the previous mm. couple of months uh, spiritually for me. Yeah, I think there was a real sense of. Um, I would say there was a real sense of, of almost like death in a way, if I can say that. And, and what I mean by that is, is, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a good kind of dying. There's a bad kind of dying. <laughs> the dying to self is, is good, you know, dying yeah. to your, your own tendencies and all that kind of That's stuff, right. your natural attitudes and really stretching, expanding your capacity for love. But then there's this kind of dying that can happen where y- you're kind of dying as an individual. You're not, you're not actually like you anymore. Yeah. And I think in, in hindsight and, and over the next couple of months after that retreat, I really had to discern what happened. It took me about eight months to leave mm. because I was just so confused. Yeah. I, needed, I yeah. needed help from some priests and some good friends to be able to guide me through what that was. And I think that I really believe that God, God called me into seminary and I needed to believe that I was going to become a priest in order to get what I needed from seminary, which was just mm. a thirst for holiness that I hope will never go away in my life. Yeah. But when the when push came to shove, God knew that I I was not gonna be fully alive in as a priest in the as diocese priest. that went on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I That's think so a lot of that actually has to do with with, with my art in my in yeah. my music and that kind of thing. I think God was was prepping me, was building me up to be, you know, a lay um missionary in a lot of ways, yeah. you know. And and now I have, you know, I'm just finishing my master's degree in theology, like I have the I have the background of um you know, a seminarian or they're in a lot of ways a, a priest, but or um at least like entry level, you know. And and that all just is um kind of feeds into this mission, you know? Yeah. But at the time it was it it was that. It it felt like um something was off. Uh, you know, it just wasn't things weren't fitting, thing life things weren't life giving, things weren't um I wasn't I wasn't growing as a person. I wasn't at peace. Yeah. Um it felt like I was dying a bit, um, maybe more than a bit, quite a bit. Um and for the for the next year and a half, probably it was really uh, okay. Well, what do I do now? You know, and yeah. that's when I started the leatherwork company, and that's where we, you know, we started doing the music again and that kind of yeah. thing. That's when I met Emma, and um, it was like the breath of God started to to really flow in me wow. again. It was like I was rediscovering who I am, but, but newly equipped with like Mm. these massive tools, you know, this like shield of truth and helmet, you know, like, uh, I just, it was just amazing. And now, you know, it's been a few years and I can look back and just see the massive amount of fruitfulness that has come from that, you know? And, uh, I think that if I would have, if I would have just lowered my shoulder and gotten ordained, you know, who knows, like woulda, coulda, shoulda, you know? Yeah these like parallel universes, like they don't exist. So it, in a way it doesn't really matter, but I kind of think about it just to, you know, just to ponder sometimes. Like I think if I would have become a priest, I think that it would have been okay. But yeah. I just think my struggles would have prevented God from making me as fruitful as I am now. I really Absolutely. think that's how it would have gone. Yeah. Yeah. And I no, think, I mean, God's ways are not our ways. And I think that openness to him and that openness to doing his will is something that we as men have to turn to every day. And so um, yeah. I think that that's phenomenal. So, uh, well, let's talk about achievement. You have uh, right. strived for it. You have, have um, uh, uh, I guess, a, a love for it, um, but also probably some some difficulties and some friction. And so I'd love to hear <laughs> hear you in, in your pursuit for, for achievement. And I mean, I 
didn't know you were full time at Archdiocese of Brisbane, in addition to your leather work and your, you know, record company. And I mean, there's just a lot going on in your life. So, you know, but let, let's start with talking about, you know, some of these underlining, you know, motivations and, um, you know, happenings. Yeah. Well, I mean, it, this will be another story, story time, Great. story time with David Cruz. That's um, right. when I was about five years old, my mom said, David, do you want to, I'll, I'll give you five cents for every dandelion that you pull up with okay. this tool yep. in the front yard. Our front yard was huge and it was covered yep. in dandelions, right? Five cents. And my mom thought that I would go out there. She thought that she could kind of just keep me entertained, you know, for a half an hour or something like that yeah. and, you know, help pull out some dandelions, whatever. I went out there in the morning and I pulled up dandelions <laughs> for like 10 hours. I went five. <laughs> like I, I filled literally like five or six garbage bags full of dandelions wow. because I was like five cents each. Like that's pretty good. You know? and, and my mom, <laughs> she ended up, she ended up paying me like 50 bucks or something like that. Cause I pulled up like a thousand dandelions. <laughs> that's awesome. Oh, I love I it. I think that's, yeah. uh, I think that's pretty much it. You know, I, I, um, I felt similar as, as, as you, I think in, in high school, I felt like I, I needed yeah. to be the best, you know? And I remember, mm -hmm. um, when I was learning how to play guitar, I would listen to John Mayer or something. I'd be yeah. like, I'll learn mm -hmm. that. I'll learn that better. I'll be able to play it better than he can. Yeah. You know? Oh, Eddie Van Halen. Yeah. I'll, I'll learn that one. Like that. Eruption. Sure. You know? Yeah. I'll learn it. You know, I just had this attitude of like, yeah, I'll, I'll be better. You know, it'll take yeah. a lot of work, but like, I'll be better at it. I can do you know? it. Yeah. And it was, it was, it was, a, it was, it really was a problem back then. Yeah. You know, mm. it really was. It, yeah. it was just, it was an obsession. It was a need. It was, if it wasn't perfect, then I hated myself, you know? Yeah. Yeah, me and, too. Um, I get it. Yeah. You know, and it was just, it was, it, it was, it was so wrapped up in the identity. You know? Yeah, it was. It you nailed it. It was wrapped up in the identity, fear of failure, or accolation, or a, you know, accolades and 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 affirmation from other people, and um, and, and uh, for yourself, right? Beating yourself, and that was that was exactly yeah. it. It's like I had to uh, listen to these incredible trumpet players and something called double tonguing is a trumpet player, which is you know where your tongue touches two spots in your oh, mouth, yeah. and. And there's a, you know, world renowned trumpet player that could double tongue octaves. So it's like, doka, 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 you know, and he could jump all over the place. And I'm like, I got to be able to do that. You know, I'll never yeah. be, I, there's no need. <laughs> like I, you know, there's not a symphony written or jazz chart that has something like that. But, uh, but I got to prove to myself that I can do it. So I learned how to do it and, you know, circular breathing all these sort of things. So I get it. No, that's pretty cool. Can yeah. I just say yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's party <laughs> tricks that I have now, but yeah. So tell me about this, uh, this, uh, this pursuit of, of, of perfection to, yeah. you know, to green your identity. I love how you said that. Cause that's so true. Yeah. Well, it really, you know, it, it was, it was a vice, uh, until I got into seminary. And I, I remember going for a walk with my Bishop because the first couple of years of seminary, I just couldn't stop thinking about music. Couldn't stop thinking about music projects. Mm. I just wanted to buy mics, record, you know, like do, it was just an obsession. I just, I mm. didn't want to do anything else. And it has really started to get in the way of my studies and my prayer. The first probably five silent retreats I went on. I kid you not. There was like three songs stuck in my head at the same time at all <laughs> times, the entire time. Like it was horrible. And I was yeah. just like, Oh, like I need to, I need to stop. Like I need silence, but I can't. Cause I, mm. you know, my whole high school life, I just sat and listened to music. You know, I had like sure. 18,000 songs on my, you know, iTunes or something. Yeah. Um, but what happened is, um, yeah, I, I I decided to fast, do a music fast, you know, in seminary. And so I took two years sure. where I didn't do any music and it was going to be indefinite, but my bishop said, the Lord will give it back to you when the time is right. Mm -hmm. He'll give it back to you. Mm -hmm. And uh, a couple of years later, the diocese approached me and they said, Hey, would you be interested? We're doing the uh, diocesan celebration, 125th celebration in Mankato, in your hometown. Would you be willing to put a band together of seminarians to um, play for a luncheon? Oh, and cool. I went and prayed about it and I was like, mm -hmm. I feel ready. And I feel like this is God's way of giving my music back to me. Mm -hmm. And it was after that, that things really started to change. And, um, throughout seminary, it was just a, it was a dance with that, with that achievement. You know, it was, 
I think over the years and as I get older, I realize that uh, it's not all bad, you know, like that ambition is not mm -hmm. all bad. Um, as long as it's rooted, you know, ultimately, as long as it's detached, really. And I think that's kind of where I stand now. You know, I'm 33. I got you know, we have the, we have the record label. We're doing shows, which is mm -hmm. really fun. Emma and I yeah. are, we're going to New Zealand actually like in two weeks, um, to do some shows and some retreats. Oh, how and, cool. uh, yeah. And it's like a dream, you know, like it, yeah. it, in a lot of ways, it's like a dream come true. But the truth is I don't give a crap about that. Mm. If we didn't mm. do any of it, I wouldn't care. I yeah. actually wouldn't care. And that's, that, that is probably one of the biggest graces in my life that I'm grateful for is that God, I, I use that ambition, um, to basically challenge myself, you know? Yeah. Okay. I, I'd love to become a good painter. Well, I want those paintings to be spiritually fruitful for people. So I want to learn how to, you know, paint sacred, you know, art or something like that. Yeah. I want to be able to paint, you know, and like someday I'll be able to do that and it'll just be a gift. But what I want at, at the core when the, when the day is, is, or, <laughs> um, yeah. what I want is I just want a piece of land with some grass and some trees and some kids and yeah. my wife and a house that's simple. And I can grow some, you know, tomatoes and strawberries and I can wake up in the morning and have a cup of tea with my wife and see my kids and play with them outside. You know what I mean? Like that's yeah. all I want. Yeah. I just want to be in this peace and in this relationship with God. That's just human. Yeah. You know, like just real well, down to earth. I do. I do. And I do. I want to, you mentioned peace and, you know, and so peace is often at stake, right. In the struggles of life and, and Satan knows that. And so, you know, the yeah. devil's going to do anything he can to, to banish that peace from our lives because it's in peace that God handles and, and operates for us and that can do great things in us is in that peace. So did you struggle with anxiety? Was that something that was, um, uh, a part of your life? I mean, you, you, you mentioned in show prep that there was, you know, a little bit of that and some solutions solutions and everything that you, you walk through. And I'd love to, I'd love to learn from you, you know, and, and how you, you handled that. Yeah. Yeah. No, um, anxiety was a pretty severe issue throughout, throughout seminary, I would say before that also, but I think, um, it didn't really, uh, become a, a, a horribly bad experience until seminary. And I think that's yeah. that similar concept of like, when you start to fight against something, it fights back that's when it's truth. something within you. Yeah. And, um, yeah, it wasn't until, um, uh, probably a year after I, year, year and a half after I left seminary that I really started to, to recover, I would say. Okay. And, yeah. And, um, I would say now I've, I feel fully recovered from anxiety, another huge grace, but it was a, it was a process, you know? Hmm. And, um, yeah. Tell me a little bit about the process. Well, uh, throughout seminary, it was a lot of therapy. Um, okay. and that was helpful for like, um, understanding kind of where it comes from that kind of thing. Um, but it didn't really make it go away, you know? And, sure. and I honestly, I had a, a few different therapists that just said like, like, this is, this is the horse you're riding for life. You know, yeah. like it's, it's yeah, not going to get better. You, you're That's just, right. you're just, you're just going to have to learn how to cope. That's, mm -hmm. that's the cure to anxiety. And I was just, I just never, I never believed that. I was like, I, there's just, it just can't be that way. You know, like there has to be, you know, like a singularity, you know what I mean? Yeah. There has to be like a cause and there has to be a way of undoing that. Like God had, had to have made us to be able to recover from this, you know, mm -hmm. cause it just, oh, it's just horrible. And yeah, part of it was fear motivated of like, I just, I don't know if I can handle my whole life like this, you know, sure. I'm 85 and still having these you know, anxiety attacks or whatever. Yep. But what I did was, um, there was this, um, this holy hour that I did and, uh, it was really, really powerful. I was just praying with anxiety and, and, um, really begging God to kind of sort of show me like what I needed to do. Okay. And, um, there was just this sense of peace that came over me and it was like, it was like new. It was like, everything is, everything is actually okay. You know, like if I, if I can just sort of be here right now and, 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 and feel what's going on right here and, and not 
give in to the the massive amount of narrative in my head sure. that is provoking me, that's kind of yeah. just egging me on, you know, then things are actually quite good, you know? And I, mm-hmm. and I sat there and I was like, I really started to like feel this peace and it felt like very, very delicate, you know, like it felt like at any moment I could, I could just go right back into feeling anxious, you know? Yeah. But I felt that peace and I was like, I'm going to try and like hold on to this, not anxiously hold on to this, but really just try and stay in this peace. Mm. And this is what mm. happened that night. I went to bed and I woke up at 2 a.m. drenched in sweat and, okay. and trembling. Right. And I was like, what in the world is going on? You know? And so I, eventually I fell back asleep, woke up again, also again, drenched in sweat and trembling. And I, I was like the next couple of days, I just, I was like, well, I'm just going to keep trying to stay in this kind of peace, you know? And, and, um, Next couple of days, I'm, I'm, it, it happened. It kept on happening. I kept on having mm. these kind of weird, like physiological reactions to me sure. trying to be at peace. And I yeah. started looking it up, like looking up the symptoms and everything that came up was, um, withdrawal. Yeah. And all the symptoms that, that I would type in, everything that popped up online was you're having withdrawals from something. And I was like, I wonder if there's like a chemical stress addiction, like yes. in my brain. You know, I wonder if there's something. There is. And so yeah. I started doing research about that. Yeah. yeah. And it was so fascinating to learn about stress addiction, you know, like your cortisol yes. levels being heightened. And I was like, well, that's me 100%. Yeah. Me too. Give, yeah. me Give me that. Give me that stuff. We've gone through these same experiences. The- we have had these same yeah. Google searches and stuff. <laughs> yeah. That's too funny. It's hilarious. So, yeah. It's, it's crazy, isn't it? Yeah. It is. You know? Exactly. Like, I just think that that's got to be one of the most like rampant kind of things, you know, going on. I agree. Yeah. But it, um, so that was the start, you know, for me starting to battle against the anxiety was one of the biggest tools that I found was, was realizing that when I would have like, a, you know, an, an intrusive thought or when I would yes. have, um, sort of like a, you know, of like just bad worry, that kind of thing. In the past, it was, that's a legitimate concern or whatever, you know? Now I look at that and I'm like, that's my brain trying to get a hit, basically. Yeah. Yeah, That's my brain trying Mm -hmm. to get me to, to feel that way, you know? And I see that now, I basically see anxiety as a, as a, as a former addiction, you know, it used to be what I was addicted to. Um, so there was that. And then the other thing that really, really helped was I, I got a hundred day goal journal from Barnes and Noble right. and, um, I wrote down, you know, those things are great. If you want to yeah. shred something out in a hundred days, I wrote down every day, I will recover from anxiety wow. in a hundred days, you know? Uh, and then it gives you like, you know, different, like try this, you know, and, 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 and how did it work? How did it go today? And so I spent the, probably the first 30, 40 days just trying different things. You know, I tried breathing yeah. exercises different times a day. Yep. I tried like, oh, I'll try going to the gym, trying to go for a walk every day, trying to get outside, you know, hang out with my dog, stuff like yeah. that. Like, and there was one that I tried where I thought I was sitting on the couch and, and I was just like kind of examining those, that narrative that kept on popping yeah. up, you know? And I was like, that narrative feels so different to where I am right now. Yeah. This room right now, it's pretty Mm. just relaxed, you know, it smells nice. There's a couch. I'm pretty comfortable. It's good temperature, you know, like it's relaxed. It's peaceful more or less. Yeah. And what I realized was that if I can actually just be right here right now, like if I can just engage in what I would now call the sacrament of the present moment, you know, wow, like, um, it goes away. That narrative is, actually just does. starts to go away. But it's like, it's like a muscle. Like you have to actually exercise that ability to engage with your senses in the present moment. That's right. And you have to practice it. And so what I did that day was I, I wrote down, well, I will um, try and just listen, which is actually why okay. my album is called Just Listen. <laughs> listen. Awesome. Um, and I would sit and I would actually just listen to the, to the sounds around me, listen to the birds or the cars going by or whatever, or just the emptiness of the room. And I just try and actually do nothing but listen. And I kid you not, I felt this tension in my gut, like loosen every time I did it. Mm -hmm. And I I was like, well, I'm onto something now. And, um, 
yeah, I started doing that every day, a couple times a day, a day you know, and I was working, you know, doing Oremus leather work. Like, yeah, you know, I was working so much back then, um, working like 10 hours a day. So I'd have to like stop, you know, in the shop and do that. And man, that like the, the combination of those things within a couple of months, I felt great. I felt uh-huh. better than I had felt since I was about 12 years old. Wow. You know, and to That's this so day, awesome. Yeah. To this day, it's still, it's still going, you know, and, and I have to keep an eye on it and I have to do the yeah. exercises every once in a while, but now it's kind of as needed. And, um, man, it's, yeah. It's well, amazing. praise be to God. And so if anybody's, uh, any of our listeners listening to this, you check back to the Dr. Kevin Majors episode on overcoming anxiety. And we talk about this exact same thing that, you know, you're building up, you're strengthening your brain, the, the appropriate brain waves is, is really, you know, um, what, what you're doing and it takes that practice. But here's what I love. I love how your pursuit for achievement, your pursuit for perfection allowed you to stick to that hundred day journal, right. Yeah. And allowed you to, <laughs> to practice it. But this is it, right. We don't have to lose all the great yeah. the aspects of, of, of pursuit and of, of love of life and of, of passion and of our drive and everything everything like that to also not be, um, addicted as you said, or overcome with or suppressed or oppressed by, by things like anxiety and fear. And, and that that's just not of God. And he, he has a better way for us and he wants us to get there. But I just love that, that connection between how you're able to use really those strengths that you have in your life that were also working against you and also difficulties and hurdles that you had to uh, overcome, but you were able to use those in a way to, to really chart forth a better path, a better way forward in life, a better way that's more open and receptive. There you go. Just listen, open and receptive to, to what God wants for you and how he wants to form you and mold you, uh, to the man that he needs you to be for, for your wife, for your children, for society and for the church. So I think that's awesome. Amen. Well, great. Well, yeah, you know, we, we are we're at an hour. And so I am going to ask you, David, before we leave, um, where can men find out more information about you? Where would you like them to go to pick up your CD? Where would you like them to go to check out um, Oremus Leatherworks? I'm going to drop all of that in the show notes. But um, uh, so two things, where can they find out about you and any parting thoughts or uh, words of wisdom that you haven't already shared with us? Sure. Yeah. As far as what we're doing, we've got the Oremus Catholic leather work, you know, anybody interested in, uh, especially right now we're getting ready for mother's day. I'm not sure when this will be aired, but mother's day and father's day are coming up. You know, they make great gifts like head, head over to our website. It's Oremus.com O R E M O O S E.com. And, uh, we've got all kinds of stuff and, um, they're just, they're, they're beautiful, they're durable and they'll last a lifetime. Amen. Um, and then as far as the music, the, the album is actually available on, uh, the website as well. It's called just listen and it's in, uh, one of, one of the tabs. Um, uh, the CD is available, but it's also streamable on Spotify. I'm a bit anti Spotify because okay. Spotify basically rips off all musicians. <laughs> so if you really want to support artists by a Amen. CD or you yeah. know, make a donation or something, buy a hat from them. Um, but if you just want to listen to the album, head over to Spotify or any other streaming service. And we've got that. Also, my wife just released an album called Fun Sad. Uh, oh, cool. Emma, yeah. So she's Emma Frad and she is, um, on all the streaming services as well. And then we have our, our website for the record label called enemy dot com, And we're always looking for musicians that are, that are potentially interested in production, getting involved in, um, music, music stuff. You know, if you, if you've got some good music that you'd like to, um, kind of throw by us and, and see if it'd be a good fit, you know, reach out. Um, as far as parting thoughts, uh, it's been a pleasure, John, as always. Um, yeah. and, uh, yeah, I just, uh, anybody out there that's, that can relate to anything we said, I just, if, if I can, if I can say anything, it's just don't miss any opportunity you have to grow in holiness. I think that especially right now, there is just an insane need for saints. There is an insane yes. need for saints. And what it takes is somebody that's willing to read the gospels, read the words of Jesus and say, 
though that's actually real. This is this is the real deal. This is more real than what I read in the newspaper. That's this right. This is more real than anything else. And I I just I beg you to to do that, to jump in and to evangelize, to get out there, to speak the truth, um, to be bold in proclaiming God's love, to take risks in loving people, you know, and, and getting out there and giving people the gospel of Jesus Christ, because it is just so needed. And we see it every day at work here, but yeah, for anybody that, that, you know, yeah, is listening. That would be my, that'd be my parting thought. Awesome. Well, and for our listeners, that's what it means to be a real man. It's a man who lives for others. It's a man who lives for God. It's a man who strives for holiness, pursues virtue and rejects the promises of the world that, um, are fleeting and um, are based on the sands of uh, subjective humanism and, uh, and, you know, world opinions. And so David, it has been a huge blessing for me. So I am so grateful that you would join us today. And I, I just can't wait for the next time for us to have a conversation. Cool. Thanks, John. As we end each of our episodes, remember, be a man, be a saint. God bless.